the the school sort of uh, called my parents in and said, don't don't you know hang your hopes on this one. We've just hit that 100k turnover, and then the pandemic came. I'd lost probably half my clients to pausing or stopping. You know, at the time, I got campaigns going into schools, airlines, and hospitality. I can either fight or flight. So I was like, I'm fighting. This is it. I've got to make this work. So I ended up doubling the turnover in the first year of the pandemic. If people tell me that you can't do something, I almost want to prove them wrong. Emma Sanson, welcome to the Inspired By Show. Thank you. Good to be here. Good to have you here. And thank you so much for traveling all the way to not so sunny London in our studio for this interview. Now, Emma, we've known each other for quite a while now right a year I think coming up to a year about a year and uh, we've been working with you for various different ways different things we're talking a lot about your story and when I first invited you on the show you obviously wanted to share your story but it's been something that you've really been very much big on your marketing agency which you run and a little bit less about Emma Sansom so today we're going to be diving a little bit more into you behind your business but let's start off with with you and your business so for anyone that hasn't come across you before you are the owner of Flamingo Marketing Strategies And for anyone that knows you as that brand, they might be thinking, Emma, why Flamingo? Why Flamingo Market Strategy? So let's start there and then we'll go a little bit behind the scenes as to who you are. Um, So when I knew I was going to start a marketing agency, I was trying to think of a a good name um, that was catchy. At the time, my parents uh, had a a counselling practice. like, oh, do Sansom Marketing? And I was like, absolutely not. Um, I need something that's going to be memorable. Um, So I was just lying in bed one night and I just couldn't, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't think of anything. And uh, I had a card on the side from a colleague from a previous role that had to be a flamingo and a flock of pigeons on the front. And she'd put a really nice message in there and use the phrase, keep being a flamingo. Um, And I thought, hmm, flamingo, flamingo, that might work. So I went with Flamingo Marketing Strategies because there is uh, another company down south um, that's just Flamingo Marketing, that's tourism. So I thought I'd go with something that's strategies. It talks about the fact that we do focus on strategy. Mm. Um, and And I went for it. And then as the business has sort of grown and evolved, we thought we'd we'd make it even more um, different. And we have a rule where we won't work with competing companies. So they get to be the flamingo in a flock of pigeons and stand out. So that's sort of our our message um, to, to businesses that we'll work with them to help them stand out like a flamingo. Wow, I love that. I, do you know what? I've, I actually have known you for a while. I've never heard you talk <laughs> about the beer flamingo and a flock of pigeons. And I think that's really relevant for a lot of people yeah. because in so many parts of this world and so many industries, we kind of like feel like we're competing with everyone. We're just like, getting absorbed in a very competitive market. Yeah. Everything is competitive nowadays. So tell me a little bit about where Flamingo Marketing Strategy came from. You talked about the name there. What made you want to start a business? Like paint that picture for us a little mm. bit. Um, I think I always probably had it in me that I would want to at some point. Like I mentioned, my parents had an accountancy practice. They're both uh, retired now. So I think the business bug was in me um, and I'd sort of worked for various different roles, um, client side and agency side. And uh, my agency side role, um, probably 23, 24 years old, was the one that made me the happiest. I loved working with SMEs um, and helping them grow. Whereas when I worked for client side and you had these massive marketing budgets and I was traveling all over the world and it was amazing, but it wasn't the same. You didn't get the same sort of joy as when you were helping mm-hmm. with smaller businesses. So I thought one day I'd like to have my own agency and um, you know the company that I'd worked for. I was so fond of the way that they ran it and it was just an amazing creative fun vibe when you had like a room full of marketing experts and just yeah so I knew one day I was going to do it um but then uh the the sort of the timing just worked out uh where I made a choice to leave a previous role to to do it and I thought do I go and get another job and and try something you know keep pushing my career upwards or do I just bite the bullet so that's the point that I thought I'm going to do it I'm going to go for it so um that's that's when it started and that was in uh 2019 it would have been um and I launched the business on June the 3rd so that would have been my nan's birthday but she passed away a couple of years uh, previous so I wanted to sort of keep the business alive um with her date of birth, um her date of birth as the birthday of Flamingo as well so I wanted to keep her in that way as well wow that's so beautiful yeah. I've never heard okay. that either from you that's, that's really nice and I think for a lot of us there are times where we want to bite the bullet and we want to start a business or we want to start a new project. Mm. But actually, so many people don't because the safety and security of having a job, especially because that was your first time leaving a job mm. to start a business. What was going through your mind at that point? You know, you've just left this job. You've got option one, which is go and get another job. 
yeah. option to start a business. What was going through your mind and what made it be like a now it now's the time? Yeah. Um I think I'd I was in a position where I I could afford to have a go, essentially. Mm. I got some money. I'm I'm a bit of a saver, so I got some money behind me and I was like, right, you know, worst case, I can probably go to three to four months and still live the lifestyle that I'm living right now. Um, if it doesn't work out then obviously that's when I think yeah, I need to go and get another job. But I always knew that I would just keep keep going. I would try. If I had to get a waitressing job on the side whilst I got it off the ground, then I would do it. So mm. I was never really worried that it it wouldn't work. Um if I didn't put the time and effort into it and I was prepared to do it. But yeah, you're right. It is a bravery thing and you're getting these um, jobs coming to you and they're sort of, you know, chief revenue officer, a hundred grand a year. And you're thinking, what am I doing? Is this the right thing? Should I be starting with nothing? Um, but it all comes down to like what felt right and what I actually really wanted to do. I didn't want to go and work in another company um, in a, you know, when I knew that I, I had this desire to do it myself. And I think I was, I was ready probably two or three years earlier than I thought I would be. I thought I'd be in my early 30s by the time I started it. Um, but yeah, I think it would have been 28 um, when I started the business, so 27, 28. So it was a bit earlier than I'd planned. But you know, mum and dad, they were, I think they were cautious at first and they did say, is this definitely the right thing? But the minute I said, look, I'm doing it, I'm doing it, I think dad's exact words were, well, your father's daughter, aren't you? Because he was late 20s when he was doing it himself as well. So um, they've been like behind me every, every single day, every week going through everything with me. So they are just like the best support system with it as well. So yeah, here we are. Wow. That is so rare for parents to be so supportive. Like I'm just going to put it out there. I love my parents and I've met a load of people that have had some really supportive families, but the majority of people, when you start a business, they think you're crazy. Yeah. Yeah. The majority of parents are like, why don't you, you know, get stay in your real job, stay in your nice comfy <laughs> job, you know? And that's why I was, I was curious because obviously you had a bit of a, there's a bit of a contrast because you've got the parents that are entrepreneurial. So logic would go, oh yeah, they're going to be supportive. Yeah. But you've also got parents who are accountants yeah. who are like, I'm not offending accountants. I'm I'm a chartered accountant by trade, <laughs> yeah. so I, I'm allowed to say it, you know. Not the most adventurous slash risk. Yeah, I was gonna say the, the risk is um the challenging part in some ways. Cause even, you know, if you take a creative um, industry like mine versus the finance industry, um, mm. you know, they're great at what they do, they know the numbers, they know my numbers, which is good. It keeps me on track. Mm. But when I want to spend money on things, I feel like I have to ring and ask permission, <laughs> even though I'm like 32 years old. Um, I still feel like they are are they know a lot about that and they keep me on track mm. so I have to convince them I have to pitch to them that I want to spend money mm. I'm even working with Queens I was like okay I'm going to spend some money on a PR agency uh, and then they had to know all the reasons why but then they were fully behind it I think mm. they know I'm I'm you know I'm happy to take risks and stuff but they also know I'm really sensible and that I wouldn't be doing it if I didn't see value mm. and I'm also very good at like tracking it. I mean, I work in marketing, I have to track everything. So it's something that every year I'm looking at where I'm spending money. And if there's no value um, in there, I haven't got, you know, return on investment. I'm like, no, I'm not spending that next year. I'm going to spend that money somewhere else because I like to spend my money. Um, they'd probably be like, no, just don't just sit on the money and uh, grow the business that way. But no, I like to sort of push push our business out there and do different things. So mm. that's why I'm here. <laughs> I'm quite envious though, of you having that sort of like support system with the money side, because I I'm an ex-accountant, so a lot of people think that I'm very good with money. Yeah. Actually, I love spending. And the amount of times my finance manager is like, uh, Chloe, maybe just uh, hold back. And I'm like, yeah, but this is a good investment. <laughs> and then, and it always ends up working because that's yeah. the entrepreneur in me. And if I've, if it goes through moments where it might not, I'm like, okay, maybe let's just fix this and yeah, make more sales, exactly. whatever. But I think it must be nice to have that sort of like accountability, but also support network. Yeah. It's really helpful that they're accountants. Um, I hated maths. I was so rubbish at maths at school. I even got a tutor. My sister was brilliant at maths and wouldn't help me. I think there was a particular day mum said, can you help your little sister with the homework? And she sat with me and she was like, I can't do it. You're just too rubbish at maths. I can't. I can't do it, mum. I can't. Um, so I was never going to take over the accountancy practice. And my sister decided to go and travel the world. So she lives in Mexico now. So um, she would have been great at that, but she wasn't what she wanted to do. So uh, we've always sort of had that 
they're good with the numbers and I'm good with the creative side, mm. um, which the, the good side of that is mum loves doing the bookkeeping with me. So I still do everything myself. I haven't sort of outsourced anything. I'll sit with her every month. My um, accounts are fantastically ordered, filed. Everything's up to date. Um, no bags of receipts handing over to accountants. In the, and obviously dad does manual accounts, which is brilliant. So, um, mm. And she comes with loads of chocolate and snacks for me because she knows that I don't enjoy doing it. Mm. But she's there to, she's, oh, it's just time with you. I enjoy it. And I'm like, yeah, I don't. But okay, well, <laughs> I like, I'd rather go out for dinner with her. Yeah. But, um, but no, so it's really helpful that they want to do that. And like I said, even in December, we're sitting down on the, I think we've agreed the 29th to go through my accounts and and plan the next year of where I want to be so it's great I've got two amazing intelligent people that are behind me and they know the numbers and they know me like yeah. better than anyone so it's really it is I'm lucky I'm mm-hmm. very lucky Now, I just wanted to quickly interrupt this episode to share a quick message with you. Now, I've been hosting these interviews with Inspired by Show for a while now, and I've been loving all of the great feedback from our listeners. And it really means a lot when you all share from listening to these episodes, watching these episodes, share your incredible feedback. And I love that you love it as much as we do. Now, my mission for the Inspired by Show is to inspire others to challenge the norm, share their story, knowing that it's okay to be vulnerable and, shock horror, take the mask off and be raw and real. So, So I have a favor to ask. Can you help me on this mission by sharing this episode with someone who you think needs to hear this message? Maybe there's a friend, a loved one, a colleague, or someone that you know that would really benefit from hearing this inspiring story. If you could do that to help us help even more people to challenge the norm and push themselves out of their own comfort zone, then I'd really appreciate it. So if you haven't already, share this episode with a friend, a loved one, a colleague, or someone that you know would benefit. Now back to the episode. Maybe that's also why they probably get it more. Like, Mm. I think a lot of families just see people working. Like, let's say it's not me or you. I think we're a different situation. But a lot of people have, like, not the most supportive families, not the most supportive people around them. And they just see them working flat out, like, partners and going, well, when are you going to spend time with me? And why are you always working? And this isn't just entrepreneurial, right? Like, this is, like, people who work in the corporate world, who work crazy hours under the sun. So I think that's part of it. Now, I'm curious for you, Emma. Obviously, they are accountants and you've moved away from the accounting side, but still entrepreneurial. And it sounds to me like the sort of person from knowing you, you're very driven and it's very much like, a. am just going to, if you tell me I can't do it, I'm going to prove you wrong. <laughs> Have you always been like that? And where did that sort of like hunger come from? Yeah, um, I definitely have always been like that. It goes right back to 10 years old, uh, 11 years old, when I was sitting my 11 plus at school. Um, the the school sort of uh, called my parents in and said, don't, don't, you know, hang your hopes on this one. I don't think Emma will pass her 11 plus to get into the secondary school like Lucy did, my older sister. And uh, they sort of said, you know, like, come on, Emma, see, see if this is what you want to do. Do you want to get in? And I worked my socks off that summer. You know, there's little books that you have at home, those revision guides and stuff over there. And I worked really hard to, to sort of get get up there. And um, sure enough, I did pass it and got one of the best scores in the, in the school. So it was like, a, even from that age, I think if people tell me that you can't do something, I almost want to prove them wrong. My sister was ridiculously bright, straight A student. She And she didn't even, I mean, she was reading paperback books at the age of four and five. Like she was so clever. I was there bombing the other end of the swimming pool and climbing trees. Like we couldn't have been more different. So I did have to work a lot harder, um, I think, but... I always wanted to to make them proud and and not be, you know, not achieving and stuff like that. So, and then again, it happened at GCSEs. My science teacher was like, not your strongest subject, Emma. Maybe you should do foundation. Um, and I didn't want to do it. I thought I got into the school like everyone else. You know, I want to do the same exam as everybody else. Sure enough, I worked, I passed, got a B. Um, and I was proud that I did it. So I think sometimes the fear of failing makes me work harder whether it's been said to me by somebody else or whether it's just in me myself the perfectionist in me that's like that's not going to happen um to me and I'm going to make sure that like when I started the business your earlier question um I was going to make it work it didn't matter if I had to work two jobs outside it if I had to work long hours I didn't care I just knew that I I wanted to do it and so um that was it really Mm, wow and with what you're doing now, you're very big on obviously helping people stand out. And you've put your business brand up way above yours, mm. bef- you know, in the past. <laughs> and as I've been kicking you, nudging you in yeah. various years, I'm like, come on, Emma, let's make um, Emma Sanson be known. Um, what do you think has made you comfortable in growing the business brand versus your actual name or your individual brand? Um, 
to be honest, it's probably more ignorance. Like I never sort of started the business and thought, well, I want Emma Sampson to be someone. I just knew I wanted to have a marketing agency and I wanted to help businesses. I hope one day I might have a team and an office and everything like that. Um, it's only really getting uh, out there a bit more in my last recent year when I was going to more networking and I was going to more um, speaking, uh, public speaking and stuff like that, watching amazing talented speakers get up and talk about something. And I thought, actually, like, you know, this is this is a bit more interesting than just that. Like, mm -hmm. uh, and I thought I would try and get the business out there um, in one way and try and get my name out there a little bit in a, in a different way. So, and also I found despite building a team and having those people in place, it's, people still want me. You mm -hmm. still have, I mean, I still sell, I've, everyone comes in through me. I am the account manager. We're not like your typical agency where you get sort of passed down to other people. I am the strategy expert and I work with the clients. So mm -hmm. I think that's why I go to events and and people are going up saying, oh, where's Emma, where's Emma? Mm -hmm. And I thought, I'm never gonna separate myself from Flamingo because they people are always gonna associate it with me, but then also maybe I should just be me as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, recently I went to Aston Villa Football Club for an event and I had a speaking slot and it was the first one I've ever done. And it was very, very scary, but also really exciting at the same time. And I was Emma. I wasn't like, even though I was there talking about email marketing, it wasn't about Flamingo. I wasn't trying to sell. I wasn't using any hooks. I was just there as me on the stage. I didn't even wear pink or coral or anything flamingo -y. I was in a bright blue suit. And it felt really good to be just Emma. Um, and as you know, I've been entering awards and stuff this year. We've, we've won a couple for Flamingo and I've won one as Emma. And it's like, mm -hmm. okay, great. Maybe I can have two. I'm starting to build things up and... Uh, you know, get a, a personal website developed and stuff so I can go and do speaking slots and come on podcasts and mm. push myself out of my comfort zone. I think I hide behind Flamingo because that's what I'm really good at and I love marketing and I, I love that. But actually, I need to be brave, which is why I'm sitting here. This was definitely a sign up and worry about it later and I worried about it on the train here. <laughs> um, but here we are. So, you know, just need to be a bit braver. So that's, mm. that's why I thought push Emma a bit more. Love that. And we're just going to keep pushing and keep pushing know, until yeah. Emma says no. <laughs> <laughs> and how's that been for you now? You know, I think a lot of people can probably relate to hiding behind the business mm. brand because it's safer. It's an entity. It's not it, like a lot of people feel like they can't be like, I am me because that means I'm arrogant or yeah. I'm full of myself. And actually being Emma is helping other people and inspiring other people. So if someone was to say to you now, Emma, who is Emma? Um, so... Business is a massive part of who I am. I think I've always been like really focused on that. So I, I've i struggled in the past of having a good work-life balance. Um, but then now I've really got a good one. And I realized that the work is is one, just one part of my life. Uh, and the other part is really about my friends, my family and the things that I love doing. So um, funny enough, I went to like a speaking slot yesterday morning and it was about mental it was called mental wealth rather than mental health, which I thought was, was quite an interesting one. And he was saying that you have to find things to that make you really happy and bring out the best in you. You don't have to sit on the top of a mountain and sing Kumbaya or meditate, especially if you can't cross your legs and all this. It was a good talk. But you have to do activities that make you feel really good. So my sort of hobbies, if you like, that I um, have still continued to do whilst growing a business have been like theatre. So um, I will be uh, performing musicals, singing, dancing, acting. And I love going to see th shows at the theatre. Probably once every couple of weeks, I'm at a theatre watching something. Um, so that sort of part of my personality, I've never let dwindle. Yeah, at times when I've been really pushing, working stupid long hours, I did one year make a choice not to do a show because the business just needed a little bit more of me at that point. I was like, I need to just be present. Um, but apart from that, I was like, I need to keep that. That's my... That's my, that's me. That's my little bit of, um, it's my safe haven, if you like. It's the thing that I know and love. And it's ironic, really, because when I was on that stage doing that speaking slot, I was absolutely petrified. Yeah, I'll stand on a stage in front of a thousand people and sing. But it comes back to your previous question because I'm playing a part. I'm being a character. It's scripted for me. I just have to say the right lines and sing the right words and move in the right direction. It, it's not like I'm there very much naked as Emma not naked but naked like just strip back I'm just Emma this is who I am and it's a very different sort of thing so I think I think the only thing that's probably changed in terms of who I am over the last few years since having Flamingo 
is I don't think I put up with as much rubbish as I had done previously in terms of relationships, in terms of like negative people around me, mood hoovers. Like I've definitely changed my circles and I invest time and effort into the right people and I give them all of my love and attention and I get it back and I'm really lucky in that sense. But I've just cut out a lot of noise um, and just focused on what actually makes me happy. Um, Mm. And running the business is one part of it, but everything else, my friends, family, my hobbies, that's the other part of who I am. Mm. Do you know what? I find it fascinating how different people are, you know, because, you know, you talked about performing and I really Mm. want to touch on that because I think a lot of people can relate to this, but everyone's different, right? So I used to sing when I was growing up and I wanted to be a singer. And when I was 10 years old, I was playing the lead in a play and I panicked and I froze and I forgot all the words. And ever since then, I've never been able to get on stage (laughs) to do anything scripted. Like if you give me a teleprompter and sometimes when I run shows at stuff like this, people say, you need a teleprompter. I'm yeah. like the minute I'm told what to say I will freeze <laughs> yeah. and I would rather speak just with nothing to yeah. say in a microphone and wing it if you will yeah. in front of thousands than if you give me a script I will panic because to me that means that I have the opportunity to get it wrong yeah. like I can't get it wrong if it's just me and a mic and no one knows what I'm gonna say yeah. right it, it's just crazy That's how it. how like if we can be like very similar we are actually quite similar as individuals yeah. but like how different people can have fears around different things I think the trigger um like you said that sort of play when you were 10 it is a it's true I mean I had one I don't know how old, probably early teens maybe a little bit younger me and my sister she can sing as well we were on on the stage at karaoke or not karaoke like a talent show at the mm-hmm. caravan we used to have a caravan in the Cotswolds when we were growing up and we were singing Puppy Love and I just completely froze, didn't know the words and then said something down the mic to her. I've forgotten the words and she said, swore, I've never sing with you again. Um, and I think you could have that fear and you can hang on to it. And we then didn't do anything theatrical for a long time. We would sing in the talent shows. Mm-hmm. Mum and dad always used to say, oh, go and have a go on the karaoke so we can hear you and all of that. So we did a bit, but I never did anything until I came back from uni and I wanted a hobby and I wanted some friends. I'd been up in Leeds and... I needed some people in my circle when I was back in Warwick and I was like, I need to have something. So went and auditioned for Annie, um, the musical in Leamington and got a part in that. And then just year after year, show after show, I eventually got into some lead roles, which was brilliant. Um, played Sister Mary Patrick in um, Sister Act, you know, the, the fat, loud one, which was perfect because for the, the week leading up show week, I ate everything I wanted to do. I wasn't worried about the fact I had to shrink down into these tiny little costumes that they give you or the week, the night before. And in fact, I had to make a fat suit, which was great fun as well. But the sad part about that was when I got up to the bar afterwards and people were coming up to me saying, that was a brilliant show. Did you enjoy it? And I'm thinking... I was in it. I was quite important. <laughs> but they didn't recognise me because I was no longer mm. like 25 stone in a fat suit because I'd uh, sort of stripped it off before I went to the bar. But mm. I think, yeah, the the performance side, um, the triggers and the fears and, and overcoming them and stuff, like I, I get it. And I've always been like, the opposite to you in that sense I would rather have a script I mean coming on this and not really having any idea what we were going to talk about gave me a bit of anxiety because I was like I don't know what I'm going to say um but the other day I did a recording it was 21 marketing questions answered and I didn't script it because I didn't have time so I thought you know what I'm just going to write down 21 questions that business owners asked me about marketing and I had my little piece of paper and I had the camera and I just spoke to it and I answered every single question and it was the best thing I filmed. And I've I've got in my own way because I've wanted everything to be perfect. I haven't, I've done my first webinar this year. We're nearly five years in business and I've just done one webinar. We do webinars for our clients all the time. And mm. I'll go on as a host, but just you get in your own way, I think. And you let the fear hold you back. So meeting you was a bit of a blessing really because you've not let me hide. You've literally like, right, you're doing this, you're doing that. You're coming on the podcast. We're writing an article. You're entering an award. And it was brilliant because I had no choice but to then have to tell my story and, and talk about everything openly, which you mentioned earlier that some of it can, people are worried about looking arrogant and egotistical, which is why I think I've I've hidden behind Flamingo because I'm really proud of what that's achieved and who we're helping and we've got amazing clients and stories and it's brilliant. Um, but now I'm having to push Emma out there. I'm like, I haven't got something to hide, but you just have to do it. And like I said, I, if I'd have thought about this longer, I wouldn't be sitting in this chair. 
but I'm glad I've come because mm. now it's actually not as bad as you think. And you, you told me it wouldn't be yeah. when we were sitting in KFC before we came here. <laughs> <laughs> but, exactly. You know, I, I'm glad that I did it. So yeah. thanks for the push. Keep well, pushing me. <laughs> I will indeed. And it, to be honest, we still would have done it even if you said no, I just would have rocked up to your offices <laughs> yeah. with the film crew and we would have made it happen. Not on those safes instead. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But I'm really glad you're really honest about it, Emma, because I know for a fact there are people out there that have a mission and have a voice and can be so inspiring, but that fear is holding them back. I think we're wrong. Like, I'm not perfect I've definitely had my wobbles and I've had my moments mm. on stage where I'm like oh my god I can't believe I'm telling people this and it feels really raw and real but the more raw and real we are the more we inspire people right yeah and with that theme in mind I'm curious for you you mentioned there that you hadn't done these things from wanting it to be perfect you know previously you would have planned those 21 questions previously you would have had the script and that sort of stuff where do you think that need of perfection has come from is that something you've always had or have you sort of picked that up on the journey of being an entrepreneur yeah, it's a great question. I think I think it's always been in me a little bit growing up, you know, um went to private school, you always worked hard and you'd achieve and mum and dad, you know, worked hard, they had a really successful business and it was always like a we had a lot of fun and we had the caravan and the Cotswolds and we had a really amazing upbringing and balance, but it was always like discipline, like in, in a good way. We were respectful. We were taught to be polite. We never, you know, don't say anything unless it's nice, all of all that sort of stuff. Like it was just in me to to be the best that I could be. Mm. Um, and even now, like, you know, the guys laugh at me in the office because in the world of LinkedIn, there's debates going on left, right and centre and I can't even write a post that's slightly, um, you know, opinionated or potentially going to offend one person. I delete it within six minutes and that, that's happened once as a true story. Six minutes it lasted before I panicked and took it off and it wasn't even that bad. Um, but, you know, it's because I did never want to offend people. Um, even in my friendship circles, it's like... I don't really fall out with people. I've had got friends that I've had for years since I was seven, eight years old and they're still my, in fact, one of them was around there last night and I was helping her do her wedding website. She's We've met when we were eight years old. I think, you know, work, when you've sort of got a lot of people around you and you put a lot of love and support into them, um, you want to be the best that you can be and you don't want to fall out with people. I'm, I hate confrontation. If I think I've offended somebody or upset somebody, I know that that's part of my personality trait that I want to fix it. Some people, they might, you know, need a bit of time then relationships for example I just need a bit of I need a bit of space or time and I'd be there at the door like can we make up yet can we make up yet because I just want things to be mm -hmm. good and easy and happy so yeah I think um I do think I strive for perfection and I do think it can get in the way and that's why I think sometimes you need time pressure you need deadlines you need to mm -hmm. just be brave and just go and do something and then be like I'll figure out after like mm -hmm. I knew coming on this podcast this is not going to be the best podcast I ever do um but hopefully it won't be the last podcast I ever do with it being my first hopefully it will make me want to do more mm. and be better so mm. you know 10 years from now I'll be looking back and think oh god what was that was a trade wreck <laughs> that. but everything might be better but like mm. you say it's it's probably okay because mm. it's not planned and I'm not trying to think about every single thing I'm saying because I haven't mm. got a choice because I don't know what's going to come out of your mouth. <laughs> so exactly. exactly. It makes it a bit easier to not be perfect in this, but it, mm. it, I'll probably watch it back and I'll be like, no, <laughs> um, don't worry about that then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's the thing though. I love it because there's so much pressure to be perfect, right? And even like, like as we're recording this, like you don't know what we're going to say. I don't know what I'm going to say. We both just forgot the question. Like yeah. this is the whole point. Like it's the whole point of this show is about being raw and real mm. and knowing that that's what life's like. And for me, that's where I struggle where some people feel like they have to be perfect and they give themselves so much challenges mm. and, and so on. Now, I had this growing up as well. And this is what we talk about being so similar so many times, but when I was growing up, I always felt like I needed to be perfect because for both my parents, they were very much valued achievement, success, yeah. results. And I've gone through lots of journey and personal development and therapy and stuff to go through this. And I found that a lot of my perfectionism came from my parents being so, in my eyes, perfect. Mm. Have you ever looked back at where your need of perfection has sort of come from? Or can you remember any times where you've had that growing up? This is the challenging part because I don't, you know, I don't ever really remember anything as I'm, my memory is terrible. I actually couldn't tell you many childhood memories from probably before early teens. So that's slightly worrying for me that I just don't have it. My mm. sister can tell me about times when we were on holiday and she was seven or eight and she could remember stuff. I only remember when people tell me the stories like, and then I remember those, but I don't actually remember being there. So I don't think there was anything particularly triggering in, in my childhood or I think I can relate to you in the sense of, 
your parents being overachievers in a way or like but they they worked very very hard and I don't really my dad in particular you know you know the background accountancy January was his birthday my birthday the busiest time of the year for an accountant but he was always there like you know I always I never felt like I never saw my parents so mum mm. always did the school run she never left us too long we'd have our homework doing with her and having dinner I had a really happy childhood with a lot of fun as well so mm. I don't think that there was any sort of you must be this you must be that you must be perfect I think just these social environments I was in when you go to a private mm. primary school a secondary school was a grammar school um so it was a much more um like a bigger variety of people in that whereas you have a lot it's a lot of discipline I mean I laugh with my friends now who are teachers and they tell me the stories of some of the kids in their classes like setting fire to bins and climbing on buildings and I'm like oh my god we wouldn't even drop a bit of litter on the floor we'd be told off <laughs> um but I think that being in that world mm -hmm. of being quite disciplined and strict and respectful you know we had our little our little hats and our little ties on and all of that mm -hmm. like some people you know, we have a joke in the office because, you know, some of my team have, have private school backgrounds, some don't. And, you know, the ones that don't, they take the mickey out of us for, for doing it. And But I don't ever remember it being a negative thing. I just, I think it probably, you know, you want to pass your exams, you want to get into secondary school. Then you get to secondary school, right, you want to go to uni. So that was constantly the next thing. What's next? How are you going to achieve it? And so I think it was probably just the education mm -hmm. that made me feel like you have to be perfect. Um, but... Yeah, it's, I think that's that, That's probably it. Like, I can't mm. think of any other reason that it's happened. I just think maybe I've just been in the environments where you are pushed to achieve mm. and therefore then that's just gone into everything else. I mean, going back to theatre, you go to auditions and it's, I actually hate auditions. I love interviews, weirdly. Like, never had issues going for interviews for jobs, always did pretty well with them, hated hate it well still do to this day hate auditions um and I think you know that sort of fear of of going into that um environment and not doing the perfect audition and not getting the part I think I only ever walked out of one audition and thought I did the absolute best I could that I couldn't have gone any better and I didn't get the part anyway <laughs> so it just doesn't make a blind bit of difference you just get in your own head and you get in your own way so mm -hmm. I think I'm hoping 2024 for me will be like a bit of a right, you've proven to yourself, be a bit brave, don't let fear stand in the way and see what's possible. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited to see what we do next year. Um, and I'm sure we'll be working closely with you and uh, doing some award entries and stuff again, just seeing what mm -hmm. seeing what we're being recognized for as Flamingo and obviously as me, because I know my recent one was at Emma Sansom Award, which was great. But, you know, I think, um, yeah, I, I just think there must have just been something in my environment that maybe made me want to just do really well mm. and make everyone proud and still now like you know I'll still put the odd thing on my personal Facebook when I've won an award or I'm stood on the stage and I just love how much my friends and family are like Emma well done I'll go Emma that's amazing mm. because I feel like they take me seriously now when I started the business people probably didn't really know what was going to happen you know mm. back bedroom startup 28 year old girl on a laptop hoping that something is going to work out and now it's like you know a, a pretty successful mm. business going very well in the right direction and going I mean I'm in, I'm in Chelsea in London doing a podcast about inspiring business owners like who'd have thought in fact my friend last night was like oh maybe you'll be on Stephen Bartlett's next <laughs> but you know <laughs> who knows what's next like who knows what's mm. possible you just have to not let it stand in the way I think yeah yeah totally agree and I think it's knowing your patterns right so for example for you it sounds like you've always had that need of achievement like what mm. as soon as you've got one part what's the next step yeah have you seen that show up in your business journey as well where like you've hit one milestone <laughs> and now you, you you kind of don't look back and celebrate you just go to the next one Oh, hundred percent. In fact, I've had like a, a business coach um, over the last year as part of like a mastermind uh, group. And she has to stop me every single month and be like, what's gone well? Let's talk about your successes. Let's talk about achievements because I am that person. Like, you know, I, the first year in business, I, I didn't really have a goal, which is ironic considering my accountancy parents background. I didn't have like a financial goal. All I knew is that I wanted to be back registered. So I'd like to earn over the threshold for that. Um, I didn't really have a plan, but you know, we, we hit the hundred K mark in the first year and then I was like, 
oh, that's happened because of hard work. Obviously, I put a lot of effort in, but I didn't really have a plan. Now I'm like, you know, I've got plans for the next year, the year after in terms of where I'd like the business to be. But I'm also very flexible with it because I think sometimes it doesn't matter how much time and effort and, you know, focus you say, I'm going to do something, something else comes up. You know, something else happens in your business. The pandemic is a perfect example of that. Um, something happens with your team or something's going on that's just causing you a headache that you've got to try and navigate. So I think if you were getting through every year and your business is still going and it's growing, whether it's a small percentage, I mean, I think last year ours grew by 46%, which I was really pleased with, um, you know, or whether it's a 10% or 5%, or even if it stays the same, you know, but you, you've got more team and you've got more going for you or whatever it is. I think we've had to really try and treat Flamingo like a client because mm -hmm. for the last four years, we've just been busy doing everyone else's marketing, working on what's going to work for them, getting them to stand out. And I've, we went to an awards night and nobody even really knew who we were in like our local sort of community. And the guys at the time came back to me and they're like, Emma, you've got to get back out there, which is why I started networking, which is how I met you. Mm -hmm. um, so I did, I got I got back out there. Um, but yeah, I think having a plan and making time and effort to follow it, like we have a monthly plan now, what are we going to do for Flamingo this month? And if I can get 75% of it green, then great. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm just trying, you know, now into next year, just to keep doing the next thing mm. we've got ideas we've got stuff we want to do even on the train earlier on i was on the, coming here i thought if i do this podcast and it goes well next year i want to go on four podcasts and i'd like to do five speaking slots because now i've done that as well and i thought it wasn't it didn't kill me it went okay we'll um we'll see how it goes so that's some people that's nothing some people do four speaking slots a month but mm -hmm. for me that's massive because i'm still trying to run a business and i'm still very hands-on in the business it's not like I just sit there and let everyone else do everything. It's not mm. It's not how I run it. So small steps, but just keep taking them is how I'm going to view mm. the next sort of few years because I've done that this year and it's been another really good year for us. Yeah, I love that. I love that you're only just sat down on this podcast and you're already, before you got on, before you even get to the <laughs> studio, you're like, yeah, I'm going to do more next year. So I was literally like grinning like a Cheshire cat when you said that. I was like, yes, Emma, this is, this is exactly what we want. Yeah, well, until I walked in the room and I saw the setup and I was like, Oh my god, this is this is it. This is happening. <laughs> exactly. Right. Now, um obviously you've talked very logical about the journey you've been on and the achievements you've had and it's so inspiring. A lot of people don't have a smooth journey and I also know your journey hasn't always been that smooth. Mm. What's been the biggest challenge you've faced in your sort of like you've been in business nearly 5 years? What's been the biggest challenge you faced and how did you overcome it? Um well, as you know, it's a roller coaster isn't it? every year there's something and they might be small or big things, but the biggest thing that happened um, to me was the, it was the second year, month one, we just hit that 100k turnover and I was like having a, I was on holiday at the time with my family, I'd gone to Vietnam to see my sister who was living there at the time, now she's in Mexico, um, as you can see she's a bit of a jet setter, <laughs> um, but I'd had a really good year and I was really excited about the second year and then the pandemic came, so it was like everything that I was excited about I had this nervousness, oh God, what's going to happen? Um, and sure enough, I got back from the holiday within a few weeks. I'd had clients that are asking to pause, that needed to stop. I'd lost probably half my clients to pausing or stopping in about six weeks. Um, but the ones that were good and were staying, we had to change all their stuff as well. So, you know, at the time I got campaigns going into schools, airlines and hospitality. And I was like, could it, literally they're three industries that are probably the hardest hit um so we had to completely change everything we were doing all the hard work I'd done before I'd gone on holiday at the time it was me and one um, part-time temp that then naturally ended up leaving because she needed to be at home with her family and COVID and everything that, honestly I'd gone from being on cloud nine so thinking oh my god what what now so at that point I was like I can either fight or flight so I was like I'm fighting this is it I've got to make this work um and I knew because I'm sensible because my parents are accountants that I'd got funds behind me to have a few bad months um if that's what it came to so I just had to work super hard to try and I think I probably worked five times harder than I would have had to have worked had the pandemic not hit to get into a really good place but what happened in that year and it was a bit of an eye-opener for me as well because I would have probably done well but I think I actually did a lot better because I ended up 
doubling the turnover in the first year of the pandemic because I had to work so, so hard. Like, I mean, 16, 18 hour days, a couple of times, you know, weekends, you name it. It was, that's what happened. I took somebody on, Chris, who's still with me today. Um, You know, we were both working stupid long hours, but he became like my best friend as well because we, you know, we couldn't see anyone do anything. Like we were just constantly in contact, working together. And, and it was amazing what came from it. But you know, that that was the biggest sort of challenge that came about and it will be the same for so many businesses. And and I didn't even realize how sort of amazing that year ended up being and how how strong the, my sort of approach to sorting it was and how it turned out until a recent event where a couple of people you had to start telling stories about different things. And I mean, one woman nearly cried and she was like, that's the most amazing thing. Everyone, we all, we all just had, we gave up, We you know, with our businesses, we parked everything, we waited for it to blow over and there you are doing that. And I, goes back to the egotistical thing. I don't think like that. I don't talk about it. It's not, it's, it was, I just expected that that was normal. I just assumed that people that have got a business and they have to change something or pivot or work on mm. like even if they've changed the whole business model, you just do it because that's what that's what I thought was normal. Mm. I didn't realize that actually it wasn't normal, um, but it worked out very well in the end. But yeah, it was hard. That was mm. the year I didn't I didn't do a show. Funnily enough, <laughs> I skipped the uh, musicals um, mm. for that year. But it was really really important. To, in fact, actually, we were supposed to be going on stage doing um, all shook up, and it got pulled six weeks before. So they would have parked it for a year because of COVID. It was a year after I didn't do I didn't do it. Mm. So I had two years out. Um, but those two years out took the business from being potentially a you know, an amazing start, hitting rock bottom, then sort of going back up again. Um, and then everything else that's happened since is just pushing the boundaries, being a bit braver. Now we've got a team of six, we've got an office, um, soon to be seven or eight. I'm actually recruiting for more more flamingos um, in our little um, headquarters flock there. But yeah, no, it's it's good. It's a, It was a challenge, but it actually turned into a fantastic success story. And at the time, you just didn't know which way it was going to go. So, mm -hmm. um, and it was really hard when you were working with lots of businesses that didn't quite work out for them. They had to pause or park or whatever. But some of them have come back on now. So it's it just shows that they never they never wanted to leave. They just had no choice. But everything was sort of settled, and mm -hmm. they're doing well again as well. So mm -hmm. it's good. What was going through your mind at that point where you had that decision to make? You know, fifty percent of your business had pretty much paused or stopped, and you're sat there going. What do I do? Like, what was the thought process? Sort of tell us a little bit about that. Giving up was never an option. It was not, I had not worked that hard for the first year to walk away from it. And also knowing that even getting a job at that point would have been really hard because there'd have been lots of companies in a, like tragic scenarios where they were making loads of cuts, redundancies. So it wasn't an option. I was just so, so grateful for my accountant parents again for keeping me in line with my first year. I never went crazy. I didn't spend stupid money. I, I didn't pay myself loads and loads. I was just really sensible and it just gave me that buffer that I had time to fix it. Mm -hmm. And I was grateful to the clients that could stay and we just changed things and made it work. And, and grateful to the clients that, you know, had to pause, but they came back. Um, and also the fact, Chris, Chris was my savior. He still is. He's my right-hand man in the office. Chris came along at the perfect time because between us, we we brought in loads of new clients. We had to find new ways of working because obviously everything was remote. You couldn't build those relationships that you can, like we are doing right now. And we have them for the last year where you're face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. um, everything was harder. The churn rate of clients was higher during the couple of years of the pandemic because they never actually got to meet me. Mm. And it was crazy. You speak to people on on Zoom or whatever for a year and you meet them and in your head you like you think, you know, they're five foot nine, a little bit stocky, you go in and they're six foot six, you know, oh my God, you've got these long legs. <laughs> um but it was a completely different way that I had to run it. Mm. And what's great now is that it's back to how it I always wanted it to be. Um mm. and you know no we don't know what's around the corner. There's always something going on and you have yeah. to I think what it taught me is that you can you can get over it. Like whatever mm -hmm. comes, it might be bad, it might be really, really bad, but there is a solution and you've just got to try and find what it is and it might mm -hmm. take a week, a month or a year, but it was it was worth the fight because mm -hmm. now, I mean, we, we're nearly five, four and a half years old, we're 
doing very well in terms of turnover, the staff, the the clients are brilliant, the success stories. It's multi-award winning now this year, all in one year. Well, actually, we had one a couple of years ago, but, you know, three awards in one year where we wouldn't have even, and again, thanks to you, I wouldn't have even thought to be entering awards because we're just so busy doing everyone else's marketing. And I was mm-hmm. like, no, hang on. If we're doing marketing, we need to look good at marketing. We need to actually put stuff on our social media for a change rather than having months of nothing. Mm. Um, So, yeah, we've been really pushing ourselves this year. And it's nice I can go into a networking meeting and people know who I am and who Flamingo are. And they're always speaking to somebody yesterday and they mentioned you to me. And I'm like, brilliant. And that's Mm. it shows it's working. It shows getting out there and coming back to that bravery piece and and getting over those challenges and keep fighting. It was worth it. But like I said, it was never an option to Mm. not do it. I just needed to work out how. But I wasn't worried because mum and dad were so behind me and supportive and they always have been um and then anyone else that's sort of come into my life like say Chris for example and now I've got an amazing team but I knew I knew that I'd do it I just didn't know how but I just thought I'd figure it out as I go wing it everything I I mean I literally I'll go on I shouldn't probably say this on this podcast but I'll go on like a sales call and I'll be prepping five minutes before (laughs) um doing my little bit of research but Mm. it's like this sort of approach I'm not going on to sell I'm going on to ask questions so I've Mm. learned everything I need to know in the first 45 minutes before I then tell them what I can do to help Mm. them so um but yeah you know it's a joke in our office about Emma's you know we do like to wing it every now and again not for our clients just to be clear their marketing (laughs) is very planned out but for ourselves absolutely Mm. we're winging it um Mm. booking the speaking slots coming up with the the theme a week before in fact I was doing my webinar presentation edits the night before I was going on stage to do it yeah. um the uh, slides sorry not the webinar that was week four but yeah literally yeah. last minute but I like the pressure I've always worked well under pressure yeah that's the best thing though I think it's it's good to be the raw and real and just kind of go with the flow and also trust that you've got it yeah. you know I think a lot of times we go in business and we sort of kind of the trust goes up now Emma I'm curious for you like you've been on such a journey over these last these last five years and you've got so much more coming up we've been talking about bravery a lot what scares you about what's coming up in the future? I mean, one thing that's a, a fear for every company is, you know, the competition out there. If they're putting more time and effort in, then you're always trying to keep up with them and make sure. In fact, it's part of the reason why I started networking was because one of the local sort of agencies near me, everyone knew who they were. Fortunately, they're not a direct competitor. So they, you know, we do a lot of lead generation and and everything in marketing whereas they're more content so like you, you always sort of worry about what your competitors might be doing and, and you sort of fade into the background um but I think we've we've sort of cracked that now because we're keeping a good presence um you worry about your team you know you can have a really great team but then you might lose someone because they I mean I had a really great guy James worked for me for a while but he wanted to go and you know work for a charity in Ghana and, and I lost him and it was a really sad um goodbye at the time but he went off and did what he felt he needed to do which was right for him and it was you know an amazing send-off but that really hurt the business for a few months whilst I was trying to replace him so you can't control anything I think I I don't know what's going to come I don't know what's going to happen with my team I don't know what's going to happen with the competition um at some point I'd like to start a family that's a big thing like I know that in the next sort of you know not too distant future hopefully I would like to be thinking about having some children so I've got to make sure this business runs as well without me in it every single minute of every day as it does if I am there um and at the minute I'm still very like sort of present and I work really close with the clients and I never want to lose that so what I've got to try and figure out there is how I can still have that and be a mum and go on a maternity and and everything else Mm. that people should get to do when they're having children so I don't think I'll ever be away from the business for very long fortunately I live five minutes from the office and my mum and dad live five minutes from me so I'm pretty sure that they'll be uh, helping me out um anyway but I think it's uh it's really important to sort of um not worry too much about what might happen because who no none of us predicted the pandemic that just came all the other stuff that followed I mean and then the second and then was that like a third I feel like there were so many now I don't even know how many there were um but at the time every challenge that just came you just had to Mm. to overcome it so I'm not going to worry too much about it I'm just going to stay really focused on what's and and you mentioned earlier celebrate successes as well because you can have a year that's not like your wow year it's not the best year but the fact that you're still going Mm. in today's world where 
the economy is really bad is something to be proud of anyway so i think just small steps keep focusing on it and if something comes along that is a bit scary and talking to people as well like it's a a big thing i've realized especially in this last 12 months being sur surrounded by really good business owners that have got stories and they've had challenges and they can tell you their mistakes and you can avoid them because they've told you that's mm. really important as well so just staying close to the people that inspire me and that you know support me whether it be in business or personally um and just rolling with it i suppose winging mm. it and just seeing what happens but um yeah. but yeah I love I think that. That's probably the best way. I, I love the whole, whole concept though, because from start, like from the start of your journey, you've been very like, like you said, perfectionism must be done right. To now, the very opposite, which is like winging it, and it's because of the certainty and the confidence that you yeah. built up and experience over the time. And I always think winging it, people think it's like really disorganizing and things like that. And I actually totally disagree. Winging it is actually having the trust and faith in yourself mm. that you can handle it. Yeah. Well, that's it. I think you can only prepare up to a certain level for anything. It's like going back to the auditions. I could do two or three weeks prep or I could do two hours before. And sometimes you can even tell the difference. Mm -hmm. So it's what happens on the day can be defined by anything else that might happen. You're late for work because there's a car accident that you're stuck in traffic. You just don't know. So mm -hmm. I think... I will always have strategy. I'll always have um, logic. I can't, it's in me. I, like I said, like I, it's drilled into me from a, a young age, like to, to be smart and, and make smart choices. And, um, and uh, that's, that is a big part of who I am, but equally with, with business nowadays, sometimes I think you just have to be a little bit brave because otherwise I'm not doing, I'm not standing out. I'm literally going against the whole um, ethos of my business that's helping people stand out if I just do the same mundane things as every other marketing company does and I just have the same messages and the same like I'm not actually gonna mm. move forward so and the only thing that actually makes Flamingo different to any other marketing agency if we're really honest about it is me I'm the person that is the difference in every owner mm. of every marketing agency that's people will buy into me or they'll buy into them so if I'm not being brave and getting out there and just taking the chances and coming on podcasts or whatever it is I've got to do just to sort of push myself up a level and try something mm. new then then I'll just be the same as everybody else so mm. I love that and we've circled right back around to the whole point of Flamingo yeah. which is to stand out amongst yeah. the pigeons which is amazing now, Emma we've almost run out of time I told you it was going to go really fast it's <laughs> absolutely <laughs> flown so you're still smiling which is a great sign you're still Crying here on the inside no I'm joking, I'm joking. I'm not really. <laughs> you haven't ran out the room which is awesome <laughs> um, so Emma we have a tradition on the show where the current guest gets to share someone that they believe has an inspiring story so who do you know that has an inspiring story that you think we should have on the show next wow okay um yeah there's i'm sure there's lots of people but i'm going to link it to what we've been sort of talking about and i know the pandemic's come up and, and the knock-on effect that's had to businesses during that time there's one particular person that's jumped to mind who she was actually my first client um marie cross her name is first impression training is the company and they were hit really hard by COVID. They deliver customer service training to massive companies that everyone was being sent home and all of the systems were changing and they had to work remotely and therefore all the call centers were closing down and their whole audience just locked up overnight almost. It seemed it was a, a really difficult time for them. Um, but the reason why she's inspiring to me is because she is the most energetic, positive, lovable bundle. She's like another mum to me. In fact, I see her at events now and she's now actually met my real mum and they were having like a full-on conversation about their daughter. I'm clearly like a, a, a daughter of her <laughs> over the last few years. But I met her years ago when I used to work for another agency. She became my first client and despite anything that happened with the pandemic and all of the pain it caused them and the, the challenge, they just never stopped fighting and they kept like, getting themselves out there and trying to stay positive and you know uh, her and her husband um they've got a little grandson now and they are so happy and just it never ruined how happy and positive and energetic she was and she's always going to be inspiring in that way because I I always think you know when bad things happen or challenging things happen or people leave or you lose a client or whatever it is that comes along it just you just She's never far away. She's always liking a post or she's sort of putting something on socials and giving you a bit of that sort of a love and boost. And you just think you need to be around positive, energetic people. Mm -hmm. And she is one of the most 
bubbliest, amazing women that I've ever met. Um, so she was, yeah, definitely one of the most inspiring things. And she would be brilliant on a podcast. And she's actually, um, well, she was like based around London. I think they've moved, moved a bit further up north now, but she'd be brilliant. And she would have lots of stories, I'm sure, to tell um, people and lots of value as well because mm. she's brilliant at what she does. So yeah, Marie Cross, first, first impression training. Oh, thank you so much, Emma. I cannot wait to meet Marie and no doubt you'll <laughs> connect us after this. So thank you so much. You survived it. We're all done. I did. Whew. You okay. can have a nice deep <laughs> breath. And uh, thank you so much, lovely, for coming all the way here and being so inspiring to all of us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And thank you for pushing me into doing this. And uh, let's see what happens next day. You'll be the first to know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We'll have you back on in a year's time and see what's changed. <laughs> so guys, what an inspiring episode from an incredible human being, Emma. I've known Emma for a little while now, as you could probably tell from the interview. And she is so inspiring. So many golden nuggets shared on there. So if you haven't already, if you're watching on our YouTube channel, make sure you share in the comments what has been one of the most inspiring messages that you've taken from this episode. And more importantly, if you haven't already and you're listening on Apple, Spotify, or you're watching on YouTube, if you haven't yet subscribed, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on our next inspiring guest. I'll see you next week. Yeah.